Hello and welcome everyone to my keynote titled Riding the Fuzzing Hike Train. Over the next 40-ish hours, I will take you along on a journey on how you can find vulnerabilities in your code and how fuzzing has become such an integral part in the software development process. I'm Matthias Peyer and I run the Hex Hive Lab at EPFL. Uh, we do research in system security and software security mainly. And our contributions are in two areas. On one hand, we help the developer find as many bugs in their code before the code is actually being deployed so that the, the, code, can, the code quality can be increased and exploitable bugs can be removed. On the other hand, we are helping the user protect themselves against any kind of remaining vulnerabilities that are in the code. Uh, we will take you on on this journey and show you why fuzzing is such an such an important process. And if you've looked at the different kind of programs in the last one or two years, actually, of all the top security conferences, you may have recognized that all of them have one thing in common. What is it? It's, of course, fuzzing. Right. If you just look at this year's at Oakland, there was one session on fuzzing with, I think, a total of six or seven papers uh, on fuzzing. If you look at NDSS, there were a bunch of fuzzing papers. Um, there were even more fuzzing papers at USNIC Security with two tracks on fuzzing and 10, 15 papers. And also at RAID a little bit earlier today, you heard what the fuzz is all about. So every single security conference, along with all the software engineering conferences and the systems conferences are running sessions on fuzzing. There seems to be a massive momentum of people working in fuzzing. Now, I will tell you what fuzzing is and how you can join the fuzzing hype train as well. Join in, join in on the right and let's figure out why fuzzing has become such an important tool that is one of the get-go parts in, in every software developer's toolkit. First and foremost, I will take you to a scary place. If you look at code out there, and if you look at any kind of code base, it's full of bugs. There are bugs everywhere, and this is a scary place. And as security, researchers and security engineers, we have to do something against these bugs to make them a little bit less scary so that we can actually keep trust in, in our software and make sure that um, users, the, the data of users is protected and we cannot, uh, 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 cannot be compromised in any way or form. As it turns out, many of the bugs that are in software are exploitable. And there's not just one kind of software or one kind of exploitable. The issue here is many of these underlying bugs have intricate details that make, it, uh, make them exploitable in very weird ways for many different systems. And this could be for, for your desktop systems that are being attacked by ransomware uh, you, through, through different kinds of bugs, um, attackers exploiting vulnerabilities in hypervisor code to gain access to, to data centers, but also the, the emerging IoT platforms are a huge issue and there's their security vulnerabilities out there that are exploitable. So they could be used to compromise our smart locks, uh, invading our physical spaces. They could be used to compromise our smart cameras to spy on us and, and leak important information. Or also pretty scary, they could be used to turn our new smart vehicles into remotely controlled toy cars, which may be fun for the attacker, but it's not as fun if you're sitting inside the car. So one of the key questions that we have is, how can we make sure that there is no exploitable bugs in there, or at least if you cannot make sure that there's no bugs in there, how can we make sure that there's as few bugs in there as possible? And this is exactly where fuzzing comes in. One of the, the big decisions that I already alluded to a bit is that in software security, the, the main field, there's kind of two main thrusts. You can either prevent or you can mitigate. And both approaches have their, their advantages. Let's start with mitigations on the right-hand side. Um, and mitigation is a, is a late defense. It's a, it's a last line of defense 
that you are applying when code is actually being deployed and run on a user system. And the goal here is to make exploitation harder, right? Let's, let's just assume we know that there will be bugs in the code because there, there's just too much code out there. Let's make it as hard as possible for an attacker to uh, exploit this program. So code execution should be made harder and information leaks uh, should be made less likely. Now, the, the issue here is that it should have as little performance overhead as possible because it's, it's like an insurance policy, right, that you're paying. You're paying a little bit during execution and you want to, to be protected against certain risk of exploitation. So it's very similar to insurance policy. The other thrust is ahead of time. So while mitigations are at runtime or in line with the execution of your code, software testing happens ahead of time at the, while the developers are actually working on the code. And here, the underlying goal is to prune all the bugs ahead of time, or as many bugs as we can find. So for software testing, we could use some form of formal verification, but this may have issues with scaling to, to really large code bases. So on, on modern code bases, we often use fuzzing as a, as a get-go software testing tool. And the fuzzer actually explores the program, explores as much of the code as possible. And then we apply what we call sanitizers that then detect underlying bug, bugs and, uh, and signal to the developer that there is an actual bug. One of the challenges in current software is the actual massive, massive complexity. If you're looking at Google Chrome or Firefox for that matter, that is running on your, on your system, maybe to look at, uh, to watch this, this talk here or to browse the conference program or to look at a paper that is online, um, you're running about 70, 80 million lines of code just for your, uh, for your browser itself. And then in addition to that, if you're running uh, or if you're browsing to a modern, modern web page, you are running a couple of million lines of uh, of JavaScript code in addition to that, that is being compiled just in time. In addition, you have the user interface, GNOME in, in my case, that adds another 10 million lines of code. Then you're running on top of the windowing system, that's Xorg or Wayland, depending on your choice, another million lines of code. Um, you're using the glibc, another 2 million lines of code, and everything runs on top of the Linux kernel, which clocks in at 17-ish million lines of code. So we have an overall complexity of around 100 million lines of code, which is massive. And try to find bugs in this massive amount of code where there's very intricate and difficult um, dependencies between individual bits and pieces. It's like searching for the, the actual needle in a, in a haystack. And if you look back uh, 50-ish years ago, it took about a couple of... Uh, 100 or 1,000 pages of printed out source code to fly to the moon, written in assembly. We've now switched to high-level languages, C++, uh, which is orders of magnitude less complex. But we have hundreds of meters of printed out source code if you just print these 100 million lines of code. So printing 100 million lines of code with 17 lines per page uh, would result in about 370 meters of printed out source code. So if you just compare the two stacks, we have an, uh, a massive growth compared to 50 years ago and also massive additional bugs. And if you do remember, there have been a couple of snags even in the Apollo program where they ran into some of the, so, some issues in the, um, in, in, in the code base that they, they had. And now we have orders of magnitude more complexity. And if you look at the, the code size increase, we actually have an exponential growth in new code being added all the time. So we have more code that we, than we can handle using formal approaches. And there's no way with it we can actually verify or secure all of that code. So we have to come up with some form of best effort to, to capture the main ways how this code can be attacked. And this is exactly where fuzzing come in, comes in. If you have never heard of fuzzing, let me give you the, the one minute summary, followed by the five minute summary of how fuzzing actually works. Fuzzing is a probabilistic testing technique that um, throws random input at the program and then detects if it crashes. So we have a program here that is called test me. 
we run it with the help argument. And it tells me test me integer. Uh, we run test me with, with four A's and it says, please enter an integer. So these are two different code paths that we have already evaluated that could be interesting. Both of them could have crashed, right? Because some parsing happened at the, the, the user space uh, at the command line level. Now, if you want to fuzz this program, a very simple fuzzer could be while true do read in four random bytes from you random and run the test me program with these four bytes as an argument and done. And let me just wait until we, we actually detect a crash. If there is a crash, we would store the crashing seed for later processing. Um, and in the end, fuzzing in, is in principle generating a lot of interesting uh, potential seeds that could be run with the program and then running the test pro program is this, this, this provided environment. And then if, there, if it crashes, we store the actual output. So in the end, fuzzing is simply running the program with co some concrete input that you have generated and then observing if it crashes. And the goal of fuzzing is to make this really, really, really fast. Modern fuzzers have a couple of thousand of executions per second. So they run the program a couple of thousand times each second. Compare this to a symbolic execution that evalu evaluates a pass uh, every couple of seconds. So there, it's a couple of orders, uh, three or four orders of magnitude faster in general. At the, the loss of precision and generality, of course. Now let's go a little bit more, let's be a little bit more concrete and talk about different uh, brands of fuzzing. And let's be a bit more uh, precise of what fuzzing actually is. We have this actual program. We have a, a set of inputs that are interesting to this program. We take the program and run it with the newly generated input. Then we observe, does it crash or not? If it crashes, then we record this, this input that crashed the program and tell the developer, hey, we actually have a witness. And with this witness, you can prove that the program will crash. And this is one of the big advantages of, of fuzzing. It actually gives you witnesses, right? If you run the program again with this witness, you can reproduce the crush, crash. This is great for debugging and it allows developers afterwards to actually find where the vulnerability is and then fix it. And then we repeat. We generate new input, we run the program, we observe if it crashes, we generate new input, we run the program, we observe if it crashes until forever. Now, one of the big difficulties with fuzzing is how to actually create reasonable input that executes some form of interesting behavior in the program. One aspect that is now commonly being used is some form of coverage. And this is called gray box fuzzing compared to black box fuzzing. If it is uh, like we, we don't observe any, we only observe if it crashes or not, gray box fuzzing actually instruments the program and observes which areas of the program have been executed. And then whenever a new area is being executed, we record this and we remember, hey, this input that we just created executed new interesting behavior. Therefore, we'll keep this and actually continue the mutation based on this previous input that already triggered new behavior. So we now have two classes of output, right? Either it crashes, and if it crashes, we store the input and say, hey, this input generated a crash, and we tell the developer, or we observe, hey, this input triggers some kind of new behavior that we haven't seen. So instead of starting from scratch and creating completely new input, we can then modify the input that triggered somewhat interesting new behavior and hope that from this point on, we can move on and actually trigger some other interesting behavior, right? So we can, uh, we can form a dependence chain that continuously and iteratively modifies the, the previously interesting input and thereby refine our search for interesting behavior and then trigger interesting, interesting use cases. Now, as we know, now that we know what fuzzing is, let's see how we can actually make fuzzing effective, right? This, is, this was just the baseline. This is what happened until around 2010. This is what fuzzing was all about. And then we started exploring effective fuzzers and uh, figuring out how we can make fuzzing more effective. 
Well, first and foremost, the test cases that we generate, they must trigger bugs. And this is where coverage guided fuzzing comes in. Uh, so we, we record what areas are being executed and then use this as a feedback to inform the, the fuzzer on what interesting behavior actually happens. Second, the fuzzer must actually be able to detect bugs and underlying vulnerabilities. And this is where sanitization comes in. If you think about, uh, uh, about bugs, if, it, if there is a buffer overflow and we have some random input, uh, if you just write one byte past the end of the buffer, chances are the program will not even crash. It will just continue and happily uh, execute what, whatever is being written past the end of the buffer. And with, sanit with sanitization, we make sure that the program actually terminates. Um, an address sanitizer would be one of the, the examples that is used for, uh, for, for effective sanitization techniques. Last but not least, I think this is also, but this is also an important point. Performance is key. Fuzzing is a zero sum game. Now, we now have two optimization criteria here, right? Test cases must trigger bugs and the fuzzer must be able to detect bugs. We can invest more resources in better coverage feedback, in better input generation. We can invest more resources, more cycles into sanitization to detect more bugs. We can invest more resources into mutation. We can invest more resources into execution. We can invest more resources into whatever. But one of the key observations of fuzzing is that performance is uh, cycles are finite. For our fuzzing campaign, we have a finite amount of cycles available. And we want to use these cycles to find as many vulnerabilities as possible, right? In this finite amount of cycles, we want to find as many vulnerabilities as possible. So we have to trade off between better coverage information, better sanitization, better mutation, better whatnot, to actually find a, an, an optimal um, trade-off between these different cases to, to actually discover as many bugs as possible. Because in the end, fuzzing is about finding as many bugs as you can as fast as possible. Now let's look at some of the, the key issues that we, that we mentioned here and start with the, the first challenge, tracking coverage. How do we actually keep track which parts in the program have been executed? And what makes it interesting to, for, for further mutation? How can we infer which parts should be mutated, which parts should be analyzed? Let's take a second to talk about baseline coverage. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm showing a, a control flow graph that connects different kind of basic blocks. And the basic blocks uh, may execute uh, as, as uh, pr the program is executed. We, we may observe which transitions are happening from one basic block to the other. Um, the coverage measures which parts of the program have been, have been executed. The simplest form of coverage that we could have is function coverage. We simply keep a map of, hey, this function has been executed and, and, and simply have a, have a bit. Or we could count, this function has been executed n times, uh, incrementing it whenever a, a function is executed. The same could be done for, for block coverage, for basic blocks, line or statement coverage, edge coverage, pass coverage, or even data flow coverage. Now, interestingly, um, if we go down, it gets, a little, it gets more and more complex. And we've actually hit an optimum by tracking edge coverage. Edge coverage allows you to track the program execution in a fairly precise way by actually looking at each individual edge. Um, at the bottom, you actually see a, a set of collected coverage. You see that the, the red edge was executed once because it was, was, was entered. The orange and the light green edges were executed six times. So apparently we have executed the loop. This loop has been executed seven times. And uh, then the orange one and the blue one have been executed twice. And the purple one has been executed once. The teal one has not been executed. So we've kept track of how many loop iterations we did. It allows us to capture and compare um, what parts have been executed how many times. Uh, compared to pass coverage, pass coverage would tell us 
what is the actual pass? When did we loop? What pass did we take in each loop? How did it alternate and so on? So pass coverage would be more precise, but it's also much more expensive to collect. Because instead of, uh, we, we can no longer store pass coverage in a fixed array, but we actually have to continuously append new information to pass coverage to keep track of it. Uh, and the same goes for data flow coverage. Data flow coverage is simply too expensive to collect. Trust me, we tried and invested about two years of research into uh, data flow coverage. Um, in the end, it wasn't, uh, wasn't much more precise than anything else. So to summarize here, edge coverage is a great trade-off between cost, complexity, and precision, and gives a, a fairly good, uh, good way to capture program behavior, and is commonly used across many of the, the current fuzzers. Now, as we are collecting coverage, if you look at, at one execution of the program, we get, we get the, the coverage feedback. Now, this needs to be merged and compared with the, the actual main fuzzing process. So the fuzzer, the main fuzzer, keeps track of which program areas have been executed how many times. And a very common way is just to, to keep track of the most significant bit. So every time the fuzzer executes a new input, it reads the coverage after the execution of the input from the program and compares it. Let's see. We have our global coverage here, which is this counter. Uh, we execute one more input. We compare the most significant bit. There is no change here. There is no change here. Most significant bit is four. Um, there's no change here, 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 no change here. Therefore, we conclude that the seed that caused this coverage over here was not executing any interesting behavior. On the other hand, if we execute this other seed here, we actually observe that this edge here is executed one more time. And apparently the loop here is executed one more time. Now the most significant bit is eight. And here it was four, so there's a, a major change. Therefore, we would keep this seed here that triggered this execution for further mutation and now update the global coverage map to eight. So this is the most amount of loop iterations we have seen in this program and would continue the, the fuzzing process. Now, including the most recent seed, because this has triggered uh, this has triggered a new, uh, an additional iteration, and we have reached a new kind of behavior. This is good enough, and this is usually how um, many of the, the gray box fuzzers actually work. Now, we've looked at how these fuzzers have actually emerged and looked at the genealogy of all these fuzzers. Until 2010, not much happened. Uh, in 2013, there was the release of AFL and the Cyber Grant Challenge, if you remember the DARPA Cyber Grant Challenge for automatic exploitation. And in the end, all the different teams actually used some kind of fuzzing to find vulnerabilities in this, in this code. Um, and this resulted in what I would call the Cambrian explosion of fuzzers. And you see here, um, after 2013, after uh, AFL, a large amount of derivatives and similar fuzzers to AFL and other kind of gray box fuzzers were developed, proposed, introduced, and iterated. And we still see a somewhat exponential explosion in new fuzzing life that is happening here. Um, the color code is AFL is just the, the, the Yellow one as AFL is just demonstrating this is using regular gray box, uh, gray box fuzzing using coverage feedback. And then each of these fuzzers, because they, they need to introduce some form of, of novelty, tried some individual additional aspects, slightly modifying the approach that gray box fuzzing actually uses. Um, and we see a lot of well-known names that are now being used for all the different evaluations as new fuzzers are being, uh, being proposed. Let's look at some of these, uh, these extensions that some of these fuzzers actually have, some of the, the add-ons that they, they get in addition to, uh, to the uh, coverage and control flow feedback. If you look at the coverage metrics and try to summarize and systematize those, 
in the end, there, there's two different axes. One of them is control flow, and the other one is data flow. All of these fuzzers use um, control flow as a primary coverage metric. And I'm looking at the figure on the right-hand side. Right? It starts with black box fuzzing, which is not precise. We can count basic blocks. We can call, look at edges. We can do context-sensitive edges, and we could do pass coverage. It gets more and more precise. Um, interestingly, we can also consider some form of data flow access as secondary uh, coverage metrics. For example, some form of, of calling context, different kinds of memory accesses of the program uh, by inferring the values used in comparison operators or even um, some, some kind of taint analysis and, uh, and taint tracking during the execution of the program. If I go back to the previous slide again, you see here that a lot of these fuzzers have one or more of these add-ons in the second dimension to then complement the, the fuzzing process and get more precise. Uh, this allows us to improve the fuzzing process a bit or allows these also to improve the fuzzing process a bit um, at, at a trade-off of, of higher collection cost to actually get the information that is necessary for that. So to summarize the, the information we have learned from, from the first challenge, tracking coverage, is that, well, first and foremost, coverage helps a fuzzer to effectively explore new code areas. Code and edge coverage is very cheap to obtain and often precise enough, and it can be complemented with some additional secondary coverage metrics. Um, as we've seen with the 50-ish fuzzers that have been uh, proposed in only five or six years, there's many flavors of coverage with very subtle differences, uh, making it somewhat, even somewhat hard to compare all these different flavors that are out there. Uh, as a future research, if you're in the area of system and software security and interested to get started in, in fuzzing, one of the interesting aspects would be alternatives to code coverage. What else could we use as good feedback for the fuzzer? Is it always necessary to have code coverage or can we use something that is approximative of code coverage that gives the fuzzer enough feedback to actually guide the execution to the different program areas. What else can we use? How, how is this, uh, yeah, what else is possible even? Let's move on to the next challenge. And the second challenge is uh, actually detecting bugs. Um, I will not talk too much about sanitizers and I will simply refer to existing sanitizers such as address sanitizer, the kernel address sanitizer, uh, UBSAN, thread sanitizer for, for different thread schedules. So there's, there's many sanitizers out there that catch uh, concurrency bugs, memory safety bugs, and other kind of bugs. Instead of um, letting the program continue, they make the, the bugs explicit by adding additional checks and simply terminating the program. But we'll talk a little bit about the different aspects of detecting bugs. One of the things here, um, and this is a, a challenge with, uh, with fuzzers, is that primarily our fuzzers have been evaluated by crashes. And if you do run the fuzzing campaign, it is not uncommon that you start the fuzzing campaign at night, you go to bed, next morning you wake up and you have a couple of thousand of crashes. And AFL will tell you 124 of these crashes are unique. As a developer, you will scratch your head and, and wonder, like, how should I actually look at this? How, how, how useful is this information? Which, which bug should I look at first? And one of the big issues that we are, we are now recognizing with, with fuzzing campaigns is that um, there, there's many crashing seeds, and only a few of them will be actual bugs. In the, the disambiguation that fuzzers do, they are, they are many uh like they, they try to be conservative so if it could be a different bug they will actually keep it in and if you look at the the syscaller list of open bugs they, they have a couple of uh of hundred and i think even in the low thousand crashes that are not being triaged at the moment because there's simply no resources so developers are overwhelmed there's too many crashes out there that uh, that fuzzers report too many unique bugs that fuzzers report and we need to figure out how we can actually map the number of unique crashing seeds that a bug uh, that a fuzzer reports 
to the number of M bugs. Uh, if a fuzzer reports N crashing seeds, we know that N is larger or equal to M, the number of bugs in the program. If there is one crash, we know that we have triggered one bug. If there's 100 crashes, we may have triggered between one and 100 different bugs. Now, in practice, the number of N, the number of crashing seeds, is much larger than the number of, of bugs, often like one or two orders of magnitude for each 100 crashes or for each 100 unique crashes that your fuzzer reports, there's maybe one bug. Now, given that we have n, the number of crashing, crashing seeds, how do we distill m, the actual number of bugs, without spending massive and massive amount of developer resources? And this is a very interesting problem. How, how can we differentiate unique bugs? Let's start with a straw man. Let's group all the crashes by looking at the call stacks. Um, we just look at the first top K stack frames um, and group them based on these, these, these stack frames. Now, the big issue here is that this is going to result in a large amount of type 1 errors. So it duplicates bugs that crash at different addresses. And if you pick CV 2018, uh, 14, there's a V pointer that uh, was overwritten and now points to an illegal memory address. And we will have a crash at any of these weird different locations where V pointer is being dereferenced in many different parts through the, through the program. And this results in an over approximation. So there's a lot of duplicates uh, and this will report many unique bugs for one unique bugs. Looking simply at the crash location, um, there's another nice idea, which is record the crash location itself. This also has the, the issue of type two errors. So there are bugs that crash at the same address. They are merged. So there could be two bugs that crash at the same address in, in memcopy. So there's buffer overflow one and buffer overflow two here, both crash inside memcopy. And um, this results in, in two bugs that are actually being merged into a single class. So this doesn't work either. We actually looked at a large amount of, uh, of crashing seeds. So we looked at 59 CPU years of fuzzing, which produced 254,000 crashing seeds. Let me repeat. We had 254,000 crashing seeds out of 60 CPU years of fuzzing. So 60 CPU, CPU years of fuzzing is not too much. And 254 thousand crashing seats is clearly exceeding what the developer can look at. Um, when we analyzed existing grouping techniques, we saw that they both over and under approximated the number of bugs. Uh, what we also observed by looking at all these different, different uh, crashing seats and, and ground truths for these crashing seats was that each bug is triggerable by a unique trigger that is out there. Um, so there, there's a unique section of the pass that Uniquely, there's a small section of the past that uniquely identifies the trigger for the underlying vulnerability. The other observation we had is that large sections of the execution paths in the, to the crash are actually irrelevant. And ideally, we would separate the, the paths leading to that that are not relevant and the actual execution trigger. So we could uniquely identify the, the execution trigger based on the similarity in the control flow graph topology. Now, if we only compared the different bug triggers, we would be done. We could uniquely merge all the different bugs. This is what we want in an ideal world. Uh, separate the, the unrelated pass and the related pass to the bug trigger. And we could then use uh, some form of, of control flow graph topology. Now, our idea was that um, we want to first minimize the pass to get rid of as much of the, the extra computation to prune irrelevant sections of the past. And then in a second step cluster by, by graph topology to match similar kind of sub paths, allowing us to, to distill the actual, uh, actual crashes to the interesting locations. We are introducing Igor, which is uh, the, an, uh, a play on Ankh Morpork's Igor, which are 
humble servants of mad scientists. And we found that this would be a fitting name for all the, the fuzzers out there. And it's a, it's a multi-step process. We take in all the crashes, do some data processing, and then apply Igor fuzzing to the crashes. And in comparison to, to existing fuzzing techniques, we are not trying to increase coverage, but decrease coverage and minimize the execution uh, scope there. We then generate the traces, run them through a graph analyzer, cluster, and report cluster crashes, individual groups of similar uh, similar execution behavior, allowing us to group different bugs. In a first step, as we've seen, we apply minimizing coverage fuzzing. So this is exactly the opposite of what fuzzing does. Fuzzing tries to maximize coverage, as I just told you. But in this case, we have, we have a crashing seed. We know we are triggering a bug for the seed. But we don't know if seed A is triggering the same bug as seed B. So we are taking seed A and trying to minimize it as much as possible, getting rid of all the chunk that is not necessary. We take seed B, minimize it, get rid of as much as possible. And then we see if seeds A and B overlap in some, uh, some part. So the goal is to find the shortest path for each seed that triggers the, the vulnerability. So we, we mutate and we make sure that it still triggers the, the crash. Uh, as an input, we take a crashing seed and an output is a, another seed with a shorter path. We keep seeds during the fuzzing process if it doesn't, uh, if a seed no longer exercises a common edge from the previous, uh, previous iteration, or if the seed exercises some edges with fewer hit counts. And I'm showing you here the control flow graph of a seed of one of the vulnerabilities that we looked at that um, removed all the red nodes and added a couple of green nodes to the shortest path. So this mass ma massively shrunk the, the path that is being executed until the, the bug is actually hit, simplifying any kind of similarity analysis between two crashes. The, the white ones remain. In a second step, like if we, if we do clustering after the path minimization, we see that this actually improves clustering a lot. If we apply clustering on graph topology, on the first set of seeds without minimization, we end up with the figure on the left. So this is, this is still very hard to, uh, to actually cluster between these, uh, these four different CVs. While on the right-hand side, the clusters are clearly distinguishable and mapped to, uh, to smaller sets of clusters that, uh, that are easily distinguishable even in the, in the visual space and much more so for, uh, for a, a clustering algorithm. So detecting bugs and helping developers, let me summarize this, this aspect here. So fuzzing is great at producing crashes, but unfortunately programmers are overwhelmed by thousands of crashes that we actually look at. Crashes need, need to be distilled into bugs to be useful. Otherwise, uh, the, we will not be able to, to work through this massive amount of information that has been amassed. Um, one of the insights we had is that minimizing pass lengths of seeds enables us to match based on topology and similarity. And Igor actually grouped 254,000 crashes into 48 distinct clusters that then map to 39 ground truth bugs that we, that we analyzed. So what, it is much more feasible for a developer to analyze 48 clusters instead of 254,000 crashes. And out of the 48 clusters, uh, they resulted in 39 distinct bugs. So this is a good, uh, a good mapping overall, overall. Let's look at the last point, how to actually evaluate fuzzers and look at the performance a little bit of these, uh, of these fuzzers and how they actually map together. Comparing fuzzers is hard. And you remember the Cambrian explosion of the number of fuzzers that popped up and is still popping up at all these conferences. And we, we need, to, need to come up with metrics that allow us to compare these different tools. Code coverage is one of the metrics, crash is another one, and bugs could be an alternative. Well, code coverage, unfortunately, is very subjective and it's hard to compare if the code coverage that fuzzer A achieves is better than the code coverage that fuzzer B achieves. Crashes, as we just heard a couple of minutes ago, are imprecise. And with bugs, 
for unknown targets, we don't necessarily have ground truths. So if, if Fuzzer A says, oh, we have found five bugs in, let's say, libpng, and Fuzzer B says we found two bugs in libpng, is Fuzzer A better or is Fuzzer B better? Did Fuzzer A fuzz on the same version of the code as Fuzzer B? Right? It's, it's going to be extremely hard to compare these different fuzzers based on simply bugs without the ground truths or without comparing the fuzzers on the same bugs. There's a bunch of existing benchmarks that were developed and have been, have been released in the last couple of years. Some of them are, are actually fairly well maintained and fairly nice to, to work with, such as uh, Google's Fuzz Bench, which, which is very recent. Others have kind of lost their, um, their appeal, such as CGC where a lot of the, the programs are synthetic and it's not necessarily clear if the programs conform to, uh, to, re to real behavior and real bugs. Um, we are, as a, as a complement, we've been introducing Magma uh, that allows you to run ground truth programs with backported bugs. The key idea here is that we take a set of applications libpng, libtiff, libxml, poplar, openSSL, php, sqlite 3, lua. And then we take a recent version of the code and front port all the bugs. So we go through the commit history in the past, look at all the security critical bugs, and then front port all these bugs to the current version um, and make these, uh, these bugs detectable by implementing additional uh, assertions or, or canaries that flag when bugs are being reached or triggered. This allows us to distinguish the power of fuzzers as they are searching for these, uh, these different kinds of bugs and vulnerabilities. Magma is open source and you can, you can use it to try and test your fuzzer. So Magma is diverse. There's a bunch of different targets with different kinds of properties, such as image processing, uh, code execution, PDF rendering, SQL, um, like database queries and so on. It's verifiable. The bugs are, are detectable, triggerable, and it's very usable. So you can simply plug in your, uh, your fuzzer and then run it on top of it. We evaluated a lot of different standard fuzzers, such as AFL, AFL fast, AFL plus uh, plus, based on bug counts and how many different bugs that they find. Uh, an interesting finding was that many of the fuzzers are very similar and not really uh, distinguishable even across uh, across ten different trials, and the results will be will be highly similar. Um, some fuzzers outperform others, such as uh, mopt AFL and um, the honk fuzz are are very good in in certain configurations, along with AFL plus plus in certain configurations as well. Right, so the, some of the, the fuzzers are clearly tuned for certain or better fit for, for certain, uh, certain libraries and certain behaviors. So this may be a, a potential for future research, how to figure out what is the best configuration? How can we fine tune a fuzzer for a given program to then uh, better explore these, these programs and find more bugs there? Uh, time to, we, we also evaluate time to bugs. How quickly does it, uh, how long does it take until a bug is actually found across the, the different fuzzers? And here we see that many of the fuzzers are, are all lumped together. So there's high similarity between these different, uh, different fuzzers that have been, have been proposed and analyzed. This was somewhat surprising. We didn't expect that these fuzzers are all and under first approximation, the same or highly similar. And that's, that's definitely something that should be looked at more. Let me summarize the, the discussion on, on evaluating fuzzers. Well, first off, defining universal metrics for comparison is extremely challenging and will become even more challenging as we are further diversifying fuzzers. Uh, what we found is that ground truth bugs are closest to the main goal for fuzzing finding actual bugs. We are running fuzzing because we want to find bugs. Therefore, ground truth bugs as a metrics are very close to the main goal. And we, we argue that we should use this as, a, as an evaluation metrics. Um, distingu distinguishing reached and triggered bugs enables a second order of a comparison. Some fuzzers may be really good at producing code that reaches a certain location and terrible to actually trigger the, uh, the bug uh, underneath. And these two having canaries for both allows us to further distinguish the, uh, the fuzzer there. 
Benchmarks must be diverse, realistic, configurable, and usable. Uh, Magma is doing that. Use it and automate your, your fuzzing evaluation. Let me spend a couple of minutes on, on unsolved challenges. I hope that I, I was able to whet your appetite a bit. And I would like to highlight some of the, the open issues in fuzzing. So as you are preparing to hop on the fuzzing hype train and join the, the fuzz train, um, this may be a, a good inspiration for you to, to start working on this. Fuzzing is maturing. We are seeing the, the, their sessions at all the major conferences. But there's still a lot of open space and a lot of interesting problems to solve. So what, what are some of these, these problems that we could look at? Um, metrics for great starting seed corpora are definitely something that we need. Like how do, we, how do you define a good starting corpus? How do you generate good starting corpus when you, when you start a fresh, uh, a fresh fuzzing campaign? How do you move corpora seed, seeds from one fuzzing corpus or from one fuzzing campaign to another? How do you do cross distillation as you go from a Windows target to a Linux target? How do you keep reusing different, different seeds and states? Uh, similarly, uh, difficult challenges. How do you fuzz stateful programs that have a lot of complex internal states? I'm thinking about language interpreters and so on. Uh, how do you fuzz network protocols that go through multiple complex states? That's, that's still an unsolved problem and very interesting to look at. How do you handle peripherals for embedded systems? Because they may have very complex states that will influence the underlying, uh, underlying code. Uh, and last but not least, how could you help developers analyze discovered crashes and further distinguish and distill those? These are a couple of ideas for you to, to think about. And I would be happy to discuss, uh, discuss about them as we go to the, to the Q&A session or if you have ideas. Uh, we are always open for, for collaboration and working with many of you great folks. Let me conclude. I've talked about fuzzing for 40-ish minutes. I hope that this was interesting for you. And I hope you will be joining us, riding the fuzzing hype, hype train, and help us harvest many of these vulnerabilities that are out there. Bugs are everywhere. They exist in all the different code. And fuzzers provide some support to help us find these underlying vulnerabilities. They're already well integrated into the developer tool chain and allow us to leverage feedback to find, uh, find crashes, refining the execution of the programs as they go on. Um, as we are finding more and more, the best feedback and mutations are program dependent. And it will be interesting to see how we can come up with uh, program dependent fuzzings, uh, fuzzing strategies and automatically inferring those. As we just highlighted a couple of minutes ago, future research will depend and focus on uh, increasing the flexibility and reducing the startup cost, making it easier to fuzz targets uh, by, for example, auto-configuring uh, a seed corpus, cross-pollination of, of seeds, specializing fuzzing to new environments, generating um, state and context-aware mutation operators that are specific to a given program, automatically inferring dependencies, um, and last but not least, helping developers make sense of, of different kinds of bugs is also a good uh, and key strategy to, to help them not to drown in these large amount of error messages. So again, I hope you enjoyed this, this keynote uh, and will join us on the fuzzing hype train and help make code more secure. Thank you again. I'm open for question and thank you for your attention.